Ryan. Welcome, folks. Jacob Shoup filling in again for Tom O'Brien. He'll be back Tuesday. Back with some more good insights. The market is up today. If you didn't catch our 3 p.m. update, uh, the market just does not uh, is not really acknowledging what Powell was saying. Again, if you missed it yesterday, he was saying there is still an up, a risk to the upside with inflation. Uh, that they might have skipped uh, some rate increases, uh, you know, this time around, uh, but he expects more to come uh, throughout the rest of the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Can't talk about him. You get a little something in your throat there, huh? Anyway, um, GDX up 0.44. We're looking at the gold contract. Uh, this did pretty well today on some significant volume. Uh, definitely some big movement on it, with the dollar getting depressed quite a bit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit. I want to show you a chart here in a few uh, regarding the kind of uh, dwindling percentage uh, share that the dollar has in uh, the reserves, basically, of, uh, of different national banks. While that's mainly being taken up by euros uh, and the actual fall of the dollar, as some people are calling it, will probably take quite a while. It's still something to be uh, cognizant of. But as it stands now, um, the, the dollar is going down quite a bit. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. It's been fighting for the 101 level. Uh, we did not touch 102 just yet, uh, but we'll see what we can ha uh, what we can get done through the rest of this day and uh, tomorrow. Meta up significantly, four uh, percent today, almost 3.5. We have right here on the, uh, the the trading program. Tesla down a little bit again, breaking its kind of 14-day uh, streak there, uh, trading up. Apple up one percent, Steel Dynamics fighting. So. We were talking in the den before the show, uh, and it was brought up that the millennials just keep investing, right? And there's such a large portion of, of uh, traders now, and I want to bring in Gen Z as well, right? So people born 1996 below, and I think that there was some decent insight that they might be continuing to drive this kind of uh, bull market and, and avoid any kind of sentiments of, uh, you know, something bearish. And the thing I'll say to that, too, is young folks, they've only ever known this kind of market, right? And the way that the culture is, uh, you know, with different YouTubers, uh, different, you know, TikTokers, what have you, there is so much conversation and there really is like a subculture of, uh, you know, becoming financially um, independent based on the stock market, right? And keep in mind, too, you know, for, for younger folks, maybe people who are in their early 20s right now, they grew up seeing people make, you know, millions of dollars off extremely risky investments such as Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and also saw people make tons of money during 2020 when you had that massive pullback in March. And, uh, you know, if you just bought at that area, of course, you know, you made money and everyone makes money in the bull market. And so seeing this as a way to become financially independent, as a lot of the younger people do, kind of conceding that, uh, you know, there might be a bear market or, uh, you know, you might have to reel back some kind of investments for a time being, or maybe the stock you picked wasn't the best idea. That's, you know, you're, you're fighting against a really powerful uh, psychological kind of bias with that, right? And maybe they don't want to admit something like that. So you got to keep this kind of uh, effort going, right? Because it's your, your way out. So just some food for thought regarding that. And uh, it would be interesting to see any kind of data of how much young people are, are buying uh, and how risky they are. I will say, and this is anecdotal, of course, uh, but a lot of the younger folks I know, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk with the younger 20s range, uh, made extremely risky investments over the past few years, right? Like, had you analyzed this based on any kind of thing that university or traditional knowledge would have taught you, you know, you would not buy it, right? They did, and uh, they, they made a killing on it. And I, I can probably name about three people I have in my mind right now uh, who, who have done this. And it's, you know, it's pretty interesting, right? You know, of course, reality at some point probably catches up. But uh, for the time being, uh, you know, this market's green. And I, I think the young folks are benefiting a lot from that. Anyway, uh, you know, on the show, I like talking about uh, cybersecurity quite a bit and kind of the... Um, the market surrounding that and how I personally believe that investing in cybersecurity firms now is, is going to be pretty lucrative in the future. Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to it for some time. Uh, you know, we had legislation passed around data protection, security and retention, and that's fine. 
but what's going to start happening is, you know, your, your big companies that get targeted, uh, they're going to start historically, you know, everyone kind of saw them as victims, right? Well, the impact, and I'm talking the financial impact and uh, the impact of people's security and privacy uh, is becoming so uh, high that they're going to start having to bear the costs of it. And that's going to be mandated by the government at some point. Uh, to give you a little idea of, you know, how intense this is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but it turned out that the Chinese have uh, breached hundreds of public's private networks, a uh, security firm says. A suspected uh, state-backed Chinese hackers used a security hole in a popular email security appliance to break the networks of hundreds of public and private sector organizations globally. Nearly a third of them uh, government agencies, including foreign ministries, uh, the cybersecurity firm Mandiant, who is also the target of a pretty intense hack about a decade ago, or excuse me, um, about five years ago. Uh, this is the broadest cyber espionage campaign known to be conducted by the Chinese nexus threat actor. So, you know, listen, when, when it's state actors, you know, you're in a whole other realm of, of threat, right? Because this becomes a little bit more existential to an entire population of people. Um, but what state governments do as well is uh, attack us on an enterprise level. Okay, and the, our government in the U.S. has understood that, finally, and uh, that's why they're forcing larger companies uh, to take kind of matters into their own hands and follow certain guidelines at the risk of some kind of sanction. The Wall Street Journal posted an article, uh, and this was today, earlier, a cyber investment flows update, June 2023. Investment in cybersecurity firms and startups fell by as much as two-thirds by the first quarter of 2023. Indications are that corporate budgets for cyber spending will increase or remain the same. And I think this is a major misstep, right? Again, this kind of shows that the upper level, you know, your upper, upper level decision makers inside um, enterprise level kind of uh, companies aren't getting the message yet. And what is it going to take? And it's going to take more breaches from threat actors, essentially, um, until they lose tons of money. I mean, they're dropping by billions of dollars on in investments, and I, I don't think this is smart. The years coming, uh, this current administration, which everyone takes over as well, this is going to become a far greater focus. And so while spending has gone down this, sec uh, this quarter, keep an eye out because uh, it, it will increase over the next few years. Folks, stay tuned. We have Tim Ord on next.